the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. A Jewish divorce battle makes its way to Congress, preparing for Purim by helping those in need, exploring comics from Jewish women, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The chairman of the Ways and Means Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives is being pressured by Jewish leaders for his Jewish chief of staff's failure to give a religious divorce to his wife. In what is surely the most prominent case in Jewish history of working to obtain a religious divorce, rabbis are turning to leading websites like the Huffington Post and Politico to add pressure to call out Aaron Friedman, chief of staff to Representative Dave Camp, a Republican from Wisconsin. As TJC has reported before, divorce for some observant Jewish women can be made particularly difficult by the need to obtain a document certifying the divorce, or a get in Hebrew, before they are considered religiously divorced and free to remarry. An unwilling husband can keep a woman locked into the marriage for decades. Such women are called agunot in Hebrew, meaning chained women. In the case of Friedman, his wife, Tamar Epstein, has been seeking a religious divorce for years, and the two are engaged in what's been characterized as a bitter custody battle over their daughter. Multiple rabbinic courts have either issued orders to Friedman to provide a get or declared him in contempt. With those motivators not having work to make Friedman give a get, rabbis are turning up the heat in the most public way they ever have, something this divorce battle makes possible because of the husband's connection to a prominent politician. An online petition urging the congressman to step in has gathered thousands of signatures. Rabbi Shmuel Hertzfeld of Washington, D.C. has been particularly vocal, writing missives for the Washington Post about why Camp should intervene. In response to a reporter's inquiry about Hertzfeld's first post, Camp's office replied that the divorce, quote, isn't newsworthy, it's gossip. Hertzfeld responded with another missive on Huffington Post headlined, Note to Dave Camp, emotional abuse is not just gossip. And Hertzfeld has now told the website Politico that he is planning to write a letter of complaint to the House Ethics Committee, citing a rule that states, an employee of the House shall behave at all times in a manner that shall reflect creditably on the House. But while Jewish concern for women is getting aired in new venues, a Jewish school in Texas won't get a chance to share its talents in front of a statewide audience. The Barron Academy in Houston is an Orthodox Jewish high school with a quite good boys basketball team. The 24-5 and Barron Academy stars are so good that they made it to the four-team semifinals of the state tournament for the 2A division of the Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools. Unfortunately for them, the semifinal games are being held on Friday night and the championship game on Saturday afternoon, when the school has said it can't play because of Jewish Sabbath obligations. Though the school has been accommodated with an earlier start time in the initial rounds of the tournament, and the other three teams seemed willing to allow a rescheduling for the semifinals and tournament championship, the Barron Academy's request to have the games rescheduled this time were denied. Barron Academy withdrew from the tournament. The Texas Association of Private and Parochial Schools maintains a policy forbidding Sunday games in the tournament, as that could be a problem for Christian schools. The Barron Academy students are now finding that Jewish observance isn't always fun. But if there's one holiday where observance is most full of celebration, it's most likely the holiday that hits next week, Purim. Meredith Gansman reports on efforts to make sure it's a joyous holiday for those in need. Purim is about more than just Haman and Hamantaschen. Also traditional during the holiday, which celebrates the Jews' survival in the ancient Persian Empire, is offering a food package to a neighbor, known as Mishloach Manot. Giving charity is also customary. Volunteers turned out last Sunday for an effort that combines these two traditions. In New York, where millions of people do not have enough food to eat and rely on food pantries and soup kitchens, the Pack It Up for Purim campaign has collected some 2,000 food packages for people in need. This year's campaign is sponsored by the UJA Federation of New York, AmeriCorps, and the Metropolitan Council on Jewish Poverty. Instead of just giving, you know, a candy and a, you know, and a fruit or something like that, we're actually giving full packages that you can see inside it. Pack It Up for Purim is a specifically Jewish way of addressing the issue of hunger for low-income families in New York. I think this just all goes together as part of, you know, Jews helping other Jews. And there's unfortunately a lot of hungry, needy Jews in the city. And, you know, through UJ Federation of New York's 
initiative this year. We can actually get about 2,000 packages, 2,000 families with more food this year. But as more and more people are relying on services like food pantries and soup kitchens for aid, these charities are finding it harder and harder to meet the demand. Pack It Up for Porum is supplementary to the regular food distributions by the UJA and other organizations. We're now helping to alleviate some of the need that they have and some of the you know, the extra numbers and the extra requests by us providing this food, that many more families can get fed. The campaign also promotes healthy eating and nutrition for needy families. We have cereal, we have rice, pasta, beans, vegetables, juice, you know, 100% fruit juice. So all good, good foods, good solid food. And recipe cards for them to be able to make recipes with the ingredients we're giving them. So the food that we're giving inside is you know, a good basic for a family's one week's worth of food. For more on Pack It Up for Purim, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Helping others isn't only about providing funds. Sometimes it's about providing life-saving donations of a different sort. Christian Needham reports. Any one of these young Jewish professionals could save a life in the near future by getting a simple cheek swab. That's because the Gift of Life Bone Marrow Donation Registry has partnered with B'nai B'rith to encourage younger adult Jews to sign up as donors while attending social events like this one. The one-year-old B'nai B'rith Young Professional Network of New York City held its annual kickoff event last week at a downtown bar, appropriately named Revival, with Gift of Life representatives like Tammy Hepps registering attendees as bone marrow donors and raising both funds and awareness for young Ezra Feynman, whose quest for a bone marrow transplant inspired a video plea on his behalf from actress Mayim Bialik. Ezra has a primary immune deficiency. A transplant could save his life if a donor is found. Hepps said B'nai B'rith's involvement could save Ezra's life and the lives of others in need. Any one of these people here, all of them are somebody's miracle match. Um, so, you know, working with an organization like this that's able to draw a crowd of people who are young and idealistic and enthusiastic and healthy, you know, these are exactly the kind of people that are great for us to have in the registry. Um, you know, you're in the registry until you're 60, so, you know, you know, there are lots of years ahead of them. So, you know, everyone who's here tonight who's going to join the registry, you know, they're here to, to do good for B'nai B'rith and they're here to potentially do a mitzvah for someone out there in the world. And Jewish young professional Eric Sumberg said this won't be the only B'nai B'rith event aimed at bone marrow donations from younger Jews. There's going to be three events like this across the country and uh, we thought this was a great way to incorporate you know something that people want to go to which is to have a, a nice time at a bar for a happy hour with you know the ability to, to do a little mitzvah action. To see more from this event and to hear more about Ezra Feynman's quest for a bone marrow donor please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Finally, Rebecca Honig Friedman reports on comics from Jewish women. Comic books aren't just for kids. Featuring autobiographical work, often with very adult subject matter, the touring exhibition Graphic Details, Confessional Comics by Jewish Women, asks viewers to think of comics in a different way. Where comics are normally read as a book, here we're saying look at them as art forms, see how beautifully they're drawn, see how beautifully they've been designed, and you can even visually experience the build-up the artist has done on the page, the whiteout, the mistakes, the blue lines. Now on view at the Yeshiva University Museum in New York, the exhibit stemmed from an article that appeared in The Forward, a media sponsor of the exhibit, in 2008, that was written by journalist and co-curator Michael Kaminer. A comic enthusiast, Kaminer was at a comic convention when he spotted a trend. I noticed that there were a lot of artists there who were young women, and a lot of the young women had Jewish-sounding last names. And then when I looked at their work, it was mostly confessional and autobiographical. So I thought, three is a trend, and I ended up doing a story on it. Exhibit co-curator Sarah Lightman, a Brit whose own visual diary is featured in the exhibit, read the article. I thought, my goodness, there are all these... American Jewish women, and we should just make an exhibition out of it. And we did. The exhibit made stops in San Francisco and Toronto before coming to New York, where Lightman recently convened the first ever Graphic Details Symposium, an academic conference about Jewish women in comics. Several of the artists from the exhibit were on hand to discuss their work, 
including genre pioneer Diane Newman, who will also be at the YU Museum on March 5th for the launch of her new book, Glitz to Go. Newman has been making confessional comics since the 1970s, when, as Kaminer explained, women were often excluded by men from the underground comic scene. I mean, literally, they were shut out um, of publishing by some of the guys who were running the show. And if women did appear in underground comics back then, it was mostly as sex objects. So at the time, these confessional comics were very much a political act. For more from the artists of Graphic Details, Confessional Comics by Jewish Women, Watch the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.